So, now that we've established what we actually need to do during provisioning, let's talk about how to do it. So, provisioning is a multi-step process. The first and most critical step is we need to establish a trusted environment. And I'll talk about what I mean and why there momentarily. Then we're going to create an endorsement key if we need to. Um, we're going to track what, what the public endor uh, portion of that endorsement key is so that we can certify it. We're going to take ownership of the TBM. And then if we are creating other keys, this is a good time to do it. Not because it has to be done in this provisioning process, but because, hey, we're fiddling with the TPM anyway, we might as well do everything that we need to do in one fell swoop. <clears throat> so the reason a trusted environment is critical is this is where we are establishing trust in our hardware. And we have to use software to do it because we don't have a good way to talk directly to the chip. We have to do it via our computer, running software with the driver. And what we're worried about is that there might be some kind of malware or an adversary masquerading as a TPN. Right now, that's pretty low risk. Who's going to bother? But if somebody were to do it, and as this gets used more, it becomes a higher risk, the potential damage is very, very high. Because if somebody does masquerade as a TPM, you, you've lost all trust in that system permanently, and you may not even know you've done it. So ideally, we've got um, something that is a very minimal, trusted software, preferably with no network access at the time. So, for example, one of the things we've been testing out in the, in the last year are boot CDs running a very minimal version of Linux with no packages that we, we don't require, not even any network drivers. And then we can transfer the data off via a writable CD. Writable CD rather than a USB drive, because once it's written to, we're not going to get it overwritten. There's no chance of, of the USB drive bringing in malware of any kind. Um, of course, in the real world, we do sometimes have to make compromises. If you've got a live CD with a stack of writable CDs, one per machine, that's a technician that needs to have their hands on every single machine. That high trust, you, you've, got a, you've got things established very well, but the cost can be pretty high. It's going to be hard to scale. Um, especially when you're talking about trying to provision machines that are already out in the field, that are already on people's desktops. It's a lot easier when you're talking about, well, I've got to install my, my corporate uh, disk image anyway. Well, at that point, you're, you're rebooting the machine anyway. Adding an extra step to do TBM provisioning is actually pretty low cost if you get it at that point. The problem is most enterprises say, I've got thousands of machines, and you want me to do what to them? So, one of the things that we're seeing is people who, like, if, if you go to the only corporate vendor today of TPM applications, which is Wave Systems, um, that we know of, they're the ones who did PricewaterhouseCoopers, they have scripts that run on Windows remotely to do all this stuff. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I trust a script running remotely on Windows to establish trust in my hardware, but, um, Zeno has, has said that uh, as part of Checkmate, they have posted one version of the provisioning CD, which is that, that live CD that I was talking about, on a code repository at code.google.com. So, whoosh, there is something public that you can actually download. The live CD does not need to be unique per machine. You're going to be pulling keys off of it, which, which does need to be. Um, so that's code.google.com slash p slash timing dash attestation. Since that is getting recorded, I don't think the chat is. Um, so there are times when saying, yes, we're going to run a script on Windows remotely is the right answer. And it's the point that you say, we're not too worried about trusting all of those machines perfectly. We're willing to accept the low risk of somebody coming in and, and forging a TPM for the dramatic cost savings of having our machines out in the field be provisioned in a fairly easy fashion, what we tend to encourage is transition. Start small, over time, phase out those compromised machines. Um, so this is basically our recommendation here, is as machines are required, use the live CD. Um, when you've got 
thousands of machines that are out there, for the most part, you can use some kind of lower security process. For me, I probably still wouldn't use a Windows script, but I'm a Linux user, so I may be a little prejudiced. Um, keep in mind, in an enterprise environment, most machines are only out there for about three to five years anyway. So you say, all right, in three years, you know, certify those keys differently, make it clear that those were certified using a lower security process, and at some point, just declare them all no longer to be trusted, and you're transitioning to all of the machines you've been provisioning as they come in into the warehouse. Um, and then if you have critical machines that you really do need to trust immediately, that's the point where you say, okay, we do the hands-on process, but we are only doing the hands-on process to maybe a few dozen or a few hundred machines, not to tens of thousands. So, the only really critical part here is we strongly recommend distinguishing this in certification, preferably even with different signing keys. You can just, uh, de you know, remove one root keys trust and, and phase everything out um, without worrying about was this a good machine or a bad machine. Okay, so that's the trusted environment lecture, and, and I will get that off of my soapbox now. So, creating an endorsement key. There's two different commands you can use for it. Creating an endorsement key pair is kind of the default. And if you, you know, you have Linux, um, has command line tool for create EK, this is the command that it uses. Um, this is the one that creates an endorsement key that is permanent for the life of the TPM. And it is really what most people use in part because, as I said, people aren't entirely sure whether the revocable EK command actually exists. And even if you create a revocable endorsement key, there are some tricky bits to it. Um, create revocable endorsement key, there's a separate command that allows you to revoke the endorsement key. This requires an authorization value that is set when you created the endorsement key, which is, has nothing whatsoever to do with the owner authorization, because after all, um, you don't want the owner to be able to revoke the endorsement key at any point in time, because it's a little too easy to change the owner which means you have to track that authorization value for whatever future point in time you may wish to revoke the endorsement key, which may be part of the reason that nobody uses it. So, it does let you control the TPM uh, history a little better if you're an enterprise and you use revocable endorsement keys. At the point that you sell your machines, you can revoke your endorsement keys and somebody else is getting a TPM that is blank. There, you can't tell that this ever was a machine from your company. On the flip side, hope you actually remember that authorization value for the entire lifespan of that machine. Um, you've probably got a database somewhere. Can be done, it's there for a reason, but it's a bit of a pain in the neck and that's part of the reason that pretty much everybody just uses the basic value. Um, and it is worth noting that both of these utilities will just produce an error if an endorsement key already exists. Um, there are ways that you can tell the TPM, please tell me if there's, if there's an endorsement key, but fundamentally, for the most part, if you're doing provisioning, just try and create an endorsement key, and either it'll work or not, and if not, you'll get an error that says what already exists. Why bother checking first? It's not going to change anything if you try creating a key when there's one already there. Yes, if you use create endorsement key pair, that is a permanent key for the lifetime of the TPM. So, you cannot completely zero out the TPM without breaking it. Oh, if you use the, the endorsement key. Like, and I'll be honest, for some odd reason, I've never looked in detail at the commands that allow you to break a TPM permanently. Well, I, just I believe they exist, but I never that. paid attention. In general, it does not. The endorsement key doesn't secure any data. The endorsement key doesn't even really directly identify the machine. Because the vast majority of the time, and we'll get to the exact protocols by which we, we, we certify these other keys in the next talk, um, the endorsement key is used to certify identity keys. And for every other application, we're going to be using that identity. So the identity is the practical face of your TPM. So if I have an endorsement key and I hand the machine off to somebody else, 
the only way to make a connection between this machine with its endorsement key and all of those identities you used are if the uh, certifying authority that issued the certificate for all of those identities says, well, yes, here's the TPM those identities were associated with and here's its endorsement key. So the design according to the TCG was to make that connection very hard to forge. In an enterprise context where anonymity is not really a goal, and in fact you usually actually want to track, we expect to see much more tying of identity to TPM, but how much you care about that, how much you worry about that when the TPM is sold really depends on how secret you treat the association between the endorsement key and the physical TPM. No keys are protected by the endorsement key. Okay. The endorsement key only basically certifies them. It is responsible for making the statement, this key is a genuine TPM key. The storage root key is what protects them. Oh, that's right. And that one will go away as soon as, you, as, you, as soon as you change the machine. So I think what Glenn was sort of getting at is in the case where you you're want to give away a machine that has a TPM with an endorsement key, you know, what is the actual procedure that's necessary for all intents and purposes to make it so that there's no security violation? And I think that's just the clear, right? Because the clear will get rid of the other keys. Yes, uh, clear will get rid of the other keys. Um, and and it basically, you're clearing the owner out. That erases the SRK and everything that that TPM has stored in, it, in this lifespan is, is now useless. OK. So, once we've created an endorsement key, we need to retrieve its public component because we're going to certify it. So um, there is a command that reads the public portion of the endorsement key. This is the only thing that, that, that this command does. And I will note that this only reads the public endorsement key. There is absolutely no way to read the private portion that's secret. Um, in a fit of, I don't know if they're trying to make our lives complicated or be secure here, um, you actually have to execute this command before ownership is taken or you're going to have a much more complicated process because you have to actually reset a bunch of flags to allow yourself to read the public endorsement key once you've taken ownership. Um, why? I don't really know. I don't have insight. Um, once you have read the public endorsement key, you need to save it to transfer to a CA that's going to certify it. The question is, what, what effect does the clear command have on the PCRs? Um, I am pretty sure, let's see. Um, I'll be honest, Matthew, I would actually have to look that up. But given that PCRs are erased on every boot, and that usually when you clear the TPM, the immediate next operation is reboot the machine, uh, that's part of why I haven't looked at it. I, I can look that up for you. It's pretty quick. Um, later on. Um, so we've got a, a public endorsement queue. We want to transfer the certification authority so they can certify it. The way we recommend doing this is no matter what mechanism you're using to transmit the public endorsement key, whether you're writing it on a CD or whether you're sending it across the network, um, because we are paranoid security people, um, I do generally recommend having a you know, take a hash of that key, some kind of fingerprint, and write that value down so that when you get across to the CA, you have some kind of out-of-band mechanism, whatever it is, to make sure that the saved key you've got is the one that you actually created in that environment, and that's the one that gets certified. In part, because this does mean that you can use less secure methods of transmission. Um, but basically what we're doing here is an integrity check. Is the, the, the key we created in our secure environment the same key we're certifying? This goes double if you're using something like a USB drive, or any system you plug it into can modify things. Um, this goes triple if you're going over a network. If, for example, you say, once we've created the endorsement key, I plug the network back in, and then I just send it to my CA, that's fine as long as you have an out-of-band mechanism to make sure that that's the same key. Um, and as the name suggests, the public endorsement key is not actually secret. This is, this is just to make sure that this is the same key we can use. So now we've got an endorsement key. We can take ownership. So taking ownership 
is a command that requires two inputs because it's creating um, an owner authorization, which is basically the owner password. When you say, I want to change the TPM configuration, if you want to say, I want to create an identity, if you want to say, I want to allocate certain portions of NVRAM, those are owner operations. And this is the password that we are going to be using to give permission to do, perform those owner operations. Um, if I'm an enterprise, to be perfectly honest, given that this is much less security critical than a root password, I would be sorely tempted to use a standard value. If you really want to have one per machine, go ahead. But frankly, when you've got 20,000 machines, and this is a command that only, this is a, a, an authorization value that you're not going to use it very often, you can, you can make it infrequent. Um, if you have scenarios where owner, where users are expected to do certain operations frequently, for example, create new identities. If I'm saying that, you know, I want this machine to be able to always say that it is a legitimate um, machine for my enterprise, but not be able to tell which machine it is. Now I have an identity for the day. I can't think of too many enterprise applications. If you want to do that, you couldn't theory do that. Um, in that case, you may want to say, rather than go back to the IT department every time I want to create an identity, or every time I want to allocate my MVRAM, there is a rather complicated set of delegation commands that allow you to individually set a different password for particular owner privileges. So that I can say, the IT department is always the owner, but the user has access to creating new identities or to changing this particular flag or to modifying MVRAM. So you've got a bunch of options here that are not all or nothing when it comes to how you set the owner authorization, but just be aware of that when you decide what should the password be, how secure does it need to be. The other thing that you need to set is an SRK authorization value. Now you remember, the SRK is our storage root key. It's the thing that protects all of the data on our TPM. That means that it gets used all the time. Because in general, any key that's in the, loaded into the TPM, in order to load it, at some point I probably needed to use the SRK. Anytime I'm trying to decrypt data, I needed to have some kind of key in there to decrypt it with. That probably means I needed the SRK. So, in general, unless you're doing something very strange or something pretty unusual, like you, you've actually got a key that is owner locked permanently into the TPM, it's been loaded already, in which case that's effectively one of your root keys, you're using the SRK all the time. So, we really strongly recommend for everybody's sanity not using a password for the SRK. Um, there is a value that the TPM has called the well-known secret, which is one of my favorite phrases ever, um, that you can just set. And that means that any, every time anyone wants to use the SRK or write software using the SRK, nobody needs to worry about tracking a password. Nobody needs to worry about forgetting a password and making all of their data non-usable. If you have data that you want to have a password, don't use the SRK for it create another key that has a password that is more focused and, and, and more limited purpose. The SRK is there for the lifetime machine. You really don't want to have password issues on the SRK. So the command here is, for once, intuitively called TPM Take Ownership. Um, there is a Linux utility in the TPM Tools package. It's just a command line tool that will run this for you. Windows 7 does have a utility, technically, that will enable the TPM to take ownership, but we have had reports, which I have not personally verified, that taking ownership with this utility may cause the TPM to be unusable by anything other than BitLocker. I can't for the life of me figure out what they're doing that would cause this behavior, but I figure I should pass on the warning until we have more data. Be careful when using this because you may end up needing to clear it to re reprovision your machine. Um, so what, when you take ownership and provide it with those two passwords, it will establish the owner, set the owner authorization in the TPM, and create the storage root key. Um, the owner will stick around until you clear the TPM. There's a 
command called owner clear, this is a command called force clear. Doesn't really matter which, either of them will erase the owner. Um, you can change the owner authorization password later on. It's about what you'd expect, which is to say it's like pain in the neck, password change. There is not a mechanism to say something like, I have physical presence, please change the owner password. Um, you really do have clear it or not unless you own the password. In general, ownership is most useful during the early setup phases where you say something like, I've turned on my TPM, I would like to change the TPM's flags. We'll talk a little bit about TPM flags later. Um, most of them are not a big deal. There's a couple of them that are, you can turn on FIPS mode, which will kind of put a minimum threshold in how uh, insecure you can make anything. Um, so you, you can't create keys that are the lowest number of bits, and you can't create the legacy keys that are, have no constraints on them, that sort of thing. Um, for the most part, once you've got your TPM set up and configured, the only things the owner really does are establish identities and, and manipulate NVRAM. So, now all of the critical features of provisioning are done. We've got an endorsement key that we created in a trusted environment. We've got our public endorsement key that in some fashion we're going to ship off to a certificate authority. And we've taken ownership. Now, if we want to, we can be efficient and create some other keys. 